Okay, so uh, this is the 15 minute delayed and with an excellent improv intro um, to building quantum applications with D Waves Leap. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip over my intro, but the really quick version is that uh, I am the manager of applications development technologies and tools at D Waves. So uh, one of our mandates is writing the open source tools in Python that people use to access the D Wave system. Um, and to solve practical problems with uh, our quantum computing products. So uh, I also want to just say that, you know, we're really invested in the Python open source ecosystem. Um, and because of that, pretty much everything I'm going to be talking about today is available in open source. Um, stuff is available online and in our Leap platform. And we really, really want uh, feedback from you all. So things like GitHub issues, bug reports, pull requests, that's all super valuable to us because it helps us prioritize because we really want to be uh, make this accessible to you all. Uh, next slide. Uh, normally, I would do a quick demo with our online platform, but I think I'm going to cut that in the interest of time. So let's go on to the next one. And instead, and one more, um, and uh, talk about solving problems with binary quadratic models, which is the problem class that uh, we at D-Wave are interested in solving with our system. So I think that the uh, the metaphor that we often use when we're talking about solving problems with our system is the so-called so landscape metaphor, um, which is imagine that you are on a landscape. Um, and this, this sort of height of the various parts of the landscape, the hills and the valleys, are defined by, um, are in some sense represent the quality of your solution. And the problem that we're trying to solve is to find the lowest uh, space on the landscape um, and that one corresponds to the best quality solution. So it's a metaphor that's useful. We tend to talk about like uh, there is a large uh, energy ridge between two solutions, which means you have to walk like way uphill, accept much, much worse solutions as you, as you sort of journey uh, from one solution to another using a classical algorithm. And, and the value that quantum computing brings is its ability to essentially um, I'm going to use a metaphor here because this will get upset with me, tunnel through these energy barriers to, to sort of jump into other valleys in a way that a classical computer can't, can't do. Um, next slide, please. So to make this a little bit more concrete, I want to talk about a specific example that uh, helps sort of demonstrate how we think about solving problems with these binary quadratic models and is a really good representation of how we solve problems on the quantum computer. So, Imagine that I have a network of pipelines. You can sort of see it on the right-hand side there. Um, and these pipelines intersect at various junctions. So um, you can see that you know, the pipe between one and two and the pipe between two and three, you know, they intersect at, at junction two. What we would like to do is to find a minimum set of junctions um, from which we can monitor every pipe in the segment. So if we jump to the next slide, please. Um, so you can see here on the right-hand side an example of this, this so-called uh, minimum cover, uh, which is that from each of those different locations, we can every single pipe is adjacent to at least one of those red junctions. And it's one thing, it's important to note that there's also some, some other options here. In fact, we could, for instance, have a monitoring station at node one instead of node two. That's fine, but the point is to find some minimum set, the smallest number of loca locations from which we can monitor every junction. Um, it's also really, and, and you know, you could sort of probably work this pipeline problem out on a piece of paper without too much issue, although it's, it's not trivial, trivial. Um, but, you know, as, as you can sort of imagine that as this gets bigger, this problem becomes increasingly difficult. Uh, next slide, please. But so here's what solving that problem with the ocean tools looks like. So uh, everyone here, I think, should be, I normally would say, does everyone read Python? But I, I think here we can probably rest assured that people do. Um, so here is the Python code using our packages that solves this problem. So at the top, you can see we're importing Network X, which some of you might be familiar with. It's a, it's a very popular uh, graph library, open source library in Python that um, was developed by some folks out of Los, Al Los Alamos National Labs, but is pretty widely used. Um, and you can see right away that we're leveraging sort of Python's open source ecosystem because we have implemented our own sort of extension to that package called D-Wave Network X, which, which extends some of the notions in that one. Um, and you can also see that we're importing the sort of uh, some objects from our D-Wave system package that lets us access the quantum computer. 
Uh, let's go to the next slide. So before I, I'm going to actually jump back to that in a moment, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about how we organize our software stack. So at the very bottom, we have a set of compute resources. So those are things like CPUs and GPUs, just like normal. Uh, but what's new and different when you, when you start talking about quantum computing is the addition of this quantum processing unit. And I really want to dwell on this for a moment because um, it, it's, it's, it's important to think of this quantum processing unit as another coprocessor. It's like a GPU in that you, you're never going to use quantum QPUs to sort of, uh, you know, one of the questions that keeps getting asked is, can I play crisis? on uh, your quantum computer? And, and the answer is no, because you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't have an operating system on a quantum computer. You wouldn't uh, use it for text editing. You wouldn't use it for um, you know, watching movies. You might use it the way that you use a GPU to accelerate some aspects of that. So you might be doing rendering and use the quantum computer to accelerate that. But it's not in and of itself sort of a full-fledged uh, computer that can run you know, a, an operating system and a GUI and run a keyboard and all that fun stuff. So, Starting at the bottom, you have these CPUs and GPUs and, uh, and the QPUs. Um, sitting above that, you have a set of samplers. So these are where, this is the level that these binary quadratic models are solved at. So this is sort of a set of algorithms slash packages that people can use to solve that problem class I was describing. And then above that, uh, being a software developer and having a team of software developers, we wanted a, a uniform abstraction level um, for, for these different solvers because they all have sort of different needs and they all have um, strengths and weaknesses. Um, finally, sitting above that, we have a bunch of mapping methods. Uh, one of the ones I touched on was this Network X package. And then above that, we have our application. So let's go to the next slide, please. So, so going, you know, we can now go back to uh, that little ocean script that I described before. And here you can actually see those abstraction layers in practice. So at the top there, we have the sampler equals embedding composite D-Wave sampler. So the D-Wave sampler is our access to the quantum processor. It's the sort of, uh, it's the object that encodes the, you know, the network calls and all of that to access the QPU. Around that, we have this embedding composite. That's what gives us our uniform sampler API. That's what allows us to solve sort of, in some sense, arbitrary problems on it. Um, and then we have our, uh, we use network X to specify a graph. This is the same graph that I, you know, had in the picture before. And then we use the uh, problem mapping layer, this min vertex cover function, where we pass in the graph and the sampler, and it uses the sampler to solve this problem. So you can see that sort of abstraction layers in just one relatively short Python program. Uh, if we could jump to the next slide, please. So I'm going to not dwell too long on this, but I'll, I just want to sort of give you the mathematical formalism that underpins the problem that we're actually trying to solve here. So really the way that you should think about using our quantum computer and, and using classical solvers that solve the same type of problem is it is trying to find a vector v that minimizes this equation. And the things I want you to note about this equation is number one, that this vector v is over binary variables. So, you know, yes, no, um, or negative one, one, or zero, one. Binary, I just mean two state. Um, and the reason that this is the case is because our quantum computer has a set of qubits, and these qubits ultimately end their computation in a classical state. That's why we can read them. They, you know, when you read them, they collapse into a classical state. And so ultimately, our solutions are classical, even though our computation is quantum. The other thing that I want to note is that sort of first term in the equation, which is this uh, vi, vj, aij. This is the quadratic part of the problem. This is what makes these problems difficult. This is that sort of second order interaction between the different antenna or the different pipes and the different networks, um, vertices in my pipe network. That's what makes the problem difficult. It's not just pick the cheapest set of vertices, it's pick the cheapest set of vertices subject to uh, the requirement that each pipe have a sensor. Next slide, please. So going back to our, uh, our pipe problem, you can sort of see that why this is this binary quadratic problem. So first off, we have binary variables. Should junction one have a sensor or no? That's a binary variable. We have pairwise interactions. Um, each pipe must have a sensor. That's a sort of quadratic interaction, an interaction between two different variables. And then we have the linear optimization. I want to do it as cheaply as possible. So this, is, this, this pipeline problem was picked specifically because it is exactly already natively a binary quadratic model. So let's jump on to the, to the next slide, please. 
So I want to point out that these binary quadratic models are an NP-hard problem, which I think a lot of you are familiar with what that means. But just to belabor the point, that means that if you can solve that problem faster than other NP-hard than other NP-hard problems, then there is a fast transformation from those other hard problems into yours. And so what that means is that we are able to affect a huge variety of problems, even ones that aren't sort of natively binary quadratic models. So we take a problem, we reformulate it as a binary quadratic model, we solve it on the quantum computer, we take it back out, we undo that, that reduction. And some examples of things that we've looked at is formation of terrorist networks, we've looked at uh, traffic flow optimization, we looked at satellite placement, we've looked at protein design, we've done uh, image recognition, just you know, 200 or more uh, proof of concept and applications that have been run on the D-Wave system. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So um, I've talked a little bit about the binary quadratic models, but that's not quite a quantum machine instruction. You have to get from this binary quadratic model into something that the quantum computer can understand. So next slide, please. So uh, here is the sort of, um, you know, the pretty pictures of our, of our, the inside of our quantum computer. And so, you know, if you walked into our lab in Burnaby and outside of Vancouver in Canada, uh, you would see our uh, systems look like these big black boxes, just like you see on the left. This box is about the size of a, you know, a mid-sized bathroom. Um, the, you can see the sort of server racks there on the front. Those are, you know, a little bit shorter than a, than a uh, person. Um, and then inside the box, there is a sequence of refrigerators that are designed to keep the processor as isolated and cold as possible. So starting at sort of outside the box, obviously, is room temperature. Inside the box, it's like a refrigerator. Um, inside that first canister, you're at 50 Kelvin, then 4 Kelvin, then 1 Kelvin, then 100 millikelvin, and then 15 millikelvin. So for reference, this is uh, colder than interstellar space. It's, it's unbelievably cold. Um, and this is all to keep a little chip that's about the size of your thumbnail, which you can see in that right hand picture. Actually, let's jump to the next slide. Um, a little chip that is about the size of your thumbnail cold. And that's where the quantum, that's the quantum processing unit, this QPU. And you can see a picture there that's even zoomed in on that last picture where uh, that, that sort of um, chip holder is, is bigger than this picture. So that chip is, is really quite small. Yeah, perfect, thanks. You can see that it's being covered there by that little gold plate. If you remove the gold plate and you look at the next slide, you can see that's, that's where the chip is. So uh, jumping to the next slide. So again, this is a fairly um, math heavy and now physics heavy equation. This is the equation that defines the behavior of our quantum computer. This is called an icing Hamiltonian. And if you look over on the right hand side, um, you see an equation that looks an awful lot like that binary quadratic model I was describing. You can see that there is a sum over a bunch of, vari of binary variables. And then on the right-hand side, you see that there is a sum over quadratic inter interactions of those binary variables. We call this part of the icing Hamiltonian the quantum machine instruction. And this is the part that you are programming when you're programming the quantum computer. Uh, next slide. And Next slide. This is just the binary quadratic model, which shows you the similarity. And so there's a reasonable question, which is, you know, how do you get a binary quadratic model into a quantum machine instruction? Because, you know, those are not quite the same thing. And, and the answer is, is that a quantum machine instruction is a binary quadratic model plus some rules. Those rules are, first off, your variables must be spin. So that's negative one, one. Before I said they could be binary, they could be anything. Now they must be either negative one or one. And the reason for that is that our system is essentially running on little magnetic fields. And so, you know, we use, you know, your magnetic field is either basically pointing down or up, corresponding to spin values. We also have an energy range associated with our variables. Um, and, and there's a sort of limited uh, um, resolution that our, our processor has. And so that can be a problem. And finally, you have to be hardware structured, which is to say you must be shaped like the quantum computer. Let's go to the next slide. So if you zoom in even further on that chip picture, um, you can maybe make out, depending on the resolution of your screen, you see there's kind of a checkerboard shape on the chip. Those checkerboard shapes, each square in that checker, checkerboard corresponds to eight qubits on our quantum processing unit. And you can see on the left, the, the picture of the connectivity of our graph. So each of those eight qubit tiles is connected to the tiles to the sort of north, south, east, and west of it. And so each of these qubits is connected to six other qubits. Uh, next slide. 
Now that's true on our current 2000Q processor, but uh, in the fall we're coming out with our Advantage processor, um, which has quite a bit more connectivity and has a lot more qubits. So on the right hand side, you can see that it has a 5000 qubit processor um, with 40,000 couplers. Uh, and on the left hand side is our current technology with 2000 qubits and 6000 couplers. So ultimately, when you're getting your binary quadratic model, you need to shape it like one of these, uh, one of these processors. And how you actually do that is, is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but suffice to say, we have tricks to do that. Uh, let's advise, uh, advance two slides, please. Uh, the next one, please. Okay, so uh, before we move on to time for questions, I wanna talk a little bit about hybrid algorithm development. So hybrid algorithms are combining the best of classical and quantum computing. So uh, next slide, please. So we have uh, in Python, we have our D-Wave hybrid framework, which is a hybrid asynchronous decomposition sampler framework. Um, it uses uh, Python code to generate new uh, hybrid algorithms in a very sort of plug and play kind of way. So you can create um, brand new, never before seen algorithms uh, with just a couple lines of Python. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about different uh, types of hybrid algorithms. And in them, I'm gonna have a little snippet of Python code to sort of show you what that looks like. So next slide, please. So the motivation for, for this package is that uh, normally these algorithms are quite complicated to specify. So on the left-hand side, you can see sort of the pseudo code for a particular uh, hybrid algorithm called QBSolve. Um, and then on the middle, you can see that this takes you know, many, many, many lines of C, plus, C and C++ code. And then on the right-hand side, you can see an example that, that sort of loop racing branches, that is actual Python code um, that is used to implement this algorithm with only you know, six lines of Python. And on the bottom, you can sort of see how this algorithm is organized. The basic idea is that you're running a problem both on a classical sampler on your local system while the problem is being run remotely on the quantum computer in Burnaby. Um, you then take this, the problem, you determine which had the better solution, and then you decide whether you want to keep going. And you can either go back around the loop again or exit. So next slide, please. So I want to talk about a couple different types of hybrid algorithms because I think it's useful to, uh, to have a sense of what one could do with hybrid. So the first one is decomposition. And this is obviously most often what people think about when they think about hybrid. So the idea here is I want to grab a sub problem from the quantum computer and I want to use it, uh, and, oh, sorry, from the larger problem and then I want to solve that sub problem on the quantum computer because quantum computers have at this point uh, a relatively small number of qubits um, and not all problems can fit directly on it. Next slide, please. The next type is pre-processing. So the idea here is I'm gonna use a classical algorithm to pre-process my problem before submitting it to the quantum computer. Next slide, please. Um, the next one is post-processing. So for instance, I want to use, uh, I wanna take the quantum computer to see the classical algorithm. This is actually a very good thing to do because the quantum computer is uh, very good at finding pretty good samples quickly. Um, whereas classical computers can be, are very good at finding very good samples slowly. So if you can accelerate that by preceding the classical algorithm with a quantum computer, um, you can often get a lot of benefit. Next slide, please. Um, the next one is the so-called meta algorithm. So the idea here is I am going to take a purely classical uh, algorithm and accelerate one part of it with a quantum computer. So for instance, if I'm trying to build a strong classifier out of a collection of weak classifiers, uh, which is a typical machine learning task, I can use the quantum computer to help select my collection of weak classifiers to use to build that strong classifier. Uh, next slide. And then the last one is, it's not really a hybrid technique, but it is a useful technique, which is uh, so-called racing. So the idea is, is that the quantum computer, because it lives remotely in a lab in Burnaby, you know, when you've submitted a problem to it, it has to, you know, if you're submitting it from Europe, say, uh, it might take a second to sort of make its way across the internet and get to the get to the lab in Burnaby, and then it solves the problem on the Burnaby in a couple of microseconds, and then it comes back over the wire uh, over a second. And so, you know, your system is sitting idle for that two seconds, and there's po probably a lot of computation that could be done in that time. And so, by using racing, you can basically not you can use that time to do other useful things uh, to solve your problem. So, anyways, that's the uh, slightly rushed uh, version of my talk. I wanted to open it up to questions, although I'm not 100% sure how the questions are going to get passed to me given uh, our slightly uh, messed up setup. But yeah. This is actually going to be quite easy because I'm just going to read them out. <clears throat> Perfect. So, 
Okay, thank you for the, for the talk. That was that was nice, very intense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't really quite understand all that, but uh, you know, just in theory, the the top the high level things I think I I, I do know. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question is: How far are we from commercial quantum computing as a service? So QCAAS. Yeah, I mean, so uh, we have. Qu I mean, quantum computers are available in the cloud today. That's both D-Wave and, and other uh, providers like IBM's Qiskit. Um, so in some sense, and, and you know, they're all purchasable with um, with time. So in the commercial sense, we've already we already have that. I think implicit to your question is. Uh, when are quantum computers going to be um, valuable to customers? When are we going to start seeing advantage with quantum computers? And you know, the answer I will give is that um, we are already seeing uh, commercial advantage using hybrid systems. So that's combining quantum and classical. So we're, we're already starting to see cases where we're able to provide um, advantage to, to customers, you know, value. Now, if the customer say was to you know hire a team of computer scientists and give them a year could they come up with a classical algorithm that would would you know be able to replace the quantum computer almost certainly um this isn't sort of a scientific result but it is nonetheless uh promising that we've reached a point of sophistication with quantum computers that we are able to affect real world problems and and use them in real world commercial applications do, do you think we will see moore's law in in quantum computing so Absolutely. To expect you. Yeah. 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 I mean, okay, that, uh, just it. just to sort of give a picture, um, the the quantum computer, as I said, has to pass through all these different refrigerators, right? And when we're mm -hmm. programming the quantum computer, you're uh, you're sending signals down to that processor that's being kept at 15 millikelvin, and those signals um, are are um, oh, sorry, I'm actually talking about the ends of Moore's law. First off, we have already doubled. Uh, we double our quantum computer about every two years. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think that we're also going to run into similar limits that the classical computers are running into, which is that there's a fundamental limit, which is that eventually, you know, we're going to be able to keep doubling for, for quite a while. But eventually, we're going to start running into, you know, physics limits, which is you can't, you know, program 1 billion qubits uh, at 15 millikelvin because of the amount of heat you need to send down just to send those signals. So. I both think that for a while we're going to get that sort of end over end doubling every every so every couple of years, but I don't think it's going to last forever, just like classical computers. And then we'll be talking about a new type of computer um, that no one has thought of yet. But I'm, I'm sure. Mm, so. Okay, excellent. So next question: Are there any resources where hobbyists can play around with programming on virtualized quantum computers and algorithms? Oh, I can do better than that. You can play on a real quantum computer for free. Um, so if you go oh, right. to our uh, Leap platform, you'll get one minute of free time on the quantum computer. I know that other vendors in the space have similar programs, so it's not just D-Wave um, that you can do that with. Um, and then Ocean itself comes with a collection of uh, simulators and classical algorithms that kind of emulate the quantum computer that you can use to, to play with them if you like. But uh, a minute of, of quantum computing time doesn't sound like a, month, a lot, but since each problem only takes about um, five microseconds or 20 microseconds, it's actually quite a bit. All oh, right, nice. So next question, is it possible to sort faster than n times log n with quantum computers? Is it to sort? To sort faster than n log n. Well, the, oh. the, the, the best uh, not that I know, but, right uh, but yeah. I guess you need some more Q, Q, what a, a QPUs, you call them, right? Yeah, Qubits. I mean, so there's, there's um, uh, oh my god, I'm chuck I'm, I'm choking on the name, but the very famous quantum computing sorting algorithm that's not occurring to me right now. Um, but, uh, and that's a, that's a gate model algorithm that none of the quantum computers that exist today can run really because uh, it requires error correction or a universal quantum annealer and, and neither of those are available on the market today. Mm, okay. So next one, can you mine cryptocurrencies using quantum computing? Yes, uh, and it's, it's something that we've been asked about before. Uh, I would say that we have not yet reached uh, I'm not using it to mine cryptocurrency, so uh, I don't think we're quite <laughs> at a point where it's uh, it'll um, <clears throat> save you money. On the other hand, uh, quantum computers, by their very nature, because they're kept so cold, um, you can't put a lot of power down there. I mean, when I said before, like, oh, you're sending a lot of heat, I'm still talking about just tiny fractions of a watt. And so, so uh, they are a very energy efficient way to uh, do calculations. And so I do think that, um, if cryptocurrency sticks around and all that, that that quantum computing will be quite useful for that, just for that reason. Um, you know, having to keep them cold and having to keep uh, your data centers uh, powered is, is becoming quite a limiting factor. 
Right. I have another question uh, because there are no more questions in the Q and A. Uh, would it make sense to you know build a quantum computing data center, let's call it, uh, on the moon? Because then the you moon. don't have to. You, you have to. You know the the uh, the heat problem. You know, kind of, it doesn't go away, but it gets more manageable. That's yeah, it's a great question, and we we get asked it some fairly often. Um, you know, in terms of like, could you put it in a satellite? So. Uh, the problem is, is that getting it to uh, to Kelvin, which is about the temperature of interstellar space and sort of the dark side of the moon, um, is actually the relatively easy part of the cooling. Oh, okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. getting it down to 15 millikelvin. That's the hard part. And so, uh, and on the moon, there's less. Um, it's it's harder to dissipate heat uh, than it is on Earth. So it's actually easier to to have it here on Earth than it is uh, on the moon. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just, you know, thinking maybe, you know, you can do that. W what you said about the cryptocurrencies, though, I mean, <clears throat> if if the quantum computers actually get to the point where you can do crypto mining using quantum computers, I think the, the cryptocurrencies are basically going to collapse, right? Because they will need a completely new trip crypto to still be, uh, I mean, to, to still fulfill their purpose, right? So Yeah, I actually, it's a question I don't, I'm sure somebody is thinking about quantum secure cryptocurrency. Um, I don't. I'm someone oh, yeah, must definitely. be, yeah, <laughs> but I don't know much about it if it does exist, but I, I no doubt someone is. Okay, let me see. Um, okay, now they're discussing there. Uh, is it, um, another question here, is it kept, uh, it I, I suppose is the computer, is it kept in a void to be cooled down? Yes, it's also in a vacuum, that's right. Mm -hmm. And and you know that that um, that set of canisters is also to maintain that it's also kept in a Faraday cage, obviously to uh, limit uh, electromagnetic interference. And uh, I can also tell you that we have we are able to detect earthquakes with our quantum computer uh, because it oh, has right. to be kept very vibration free. Do you, do you have to put in any protection against cosmic rays? Uh, like, I'm not know, actually sure. It's a good question. Probably, like, but I don't know. Okay. Good. Let me see whether we have more questions. Otherwise, I think we are done. No, don't see anything. All right. All well, right. Thank, thank you, thank everyone. You Sorry for the rush talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Let me give you your applause. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Very, very nice.